Good morning. It's good to be here. I'm feeling more human every day. Um, so, yahoo! A couple of things. Uh, Doris went to the wig stylist, so she's uh, got the, <laughs> the live feed this morning. And I am on a new phone, so you'll have to let me know if it looks sharper or clearer or anything like that. Anyway, um, we're in the book of Romans. We are up to the sixth chapter of Romans. We're going to do about half of it, 14 verses. And it's really, really cool. Um, this text is very exciting to me. It is where Paul takes time to articulate what is meant by our baptism and what um, that concept of baptism means. So he is extremely clear. And I, again, I like Eugene Peterson's The Message in terms of paraphrasing it. So I've got 14 verses and um, we know that in the last chapter, he was talking to Jewish folks about how the old concepts of um, sacrifice to get right with God really wasn't sufficient and that God had a new way of doing things and that new way is Jesus. And so he talks about that new life in Christ. Here we go. Chapter six, I'm starting at verse one and I'll go through verse 14. Hey, May, good to see you. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize when, didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That's what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the country of sin behind. And when we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into life in Jesus means. When we were lowered into the water, it was like burial of Jesus. And when we were raised up out of the water, it was like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to a sin miserable life, no longer captive to sin's demand. What we believe is this, if we get included in Christ's sin conquering death, we also get included in his life saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal to the end of death is the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks to your mother tongue and you hang on every word. We are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time, remember, you've been raised from the dead, into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So um, that is really uh, just really cool. <laughs> I Again, in my Christian life, um, I've known these concepts in terms of baptism under the water. Um, we die to Christ, die with Christ. And when we rise up out of the water, we're raised into a resurrection life. And, um, and although those are images that are concepts, I believe that they're concepts that we can be lived out in our life. And it really is wonderful that Paul articulates this so clearly. Because you remember, I mean, Jesus was baptized by John, but he never had any conversation around what this um, 
what this baptism meant and what that meant for our lives. I mean, he would say, you know, take up your cross and follow me and um, die to self. But, but this was linking it to the baptism that we use to say that we enter into um, a more official relationship with our church family. I think anybody who walks through our church door <laughs> hopefully is invited and embraced into our church family. But if that person takes the focused attention to say, I want to be baptized and I want to live out that baptism in this church community, then I think it um, just kind of makes the relationship more official. So anyway, <laughs> I guess it's like folks living together and then they get married. But, um, but also that for me, this has been a really her helpful concept in terms of what I want to grow in my life and live in my life. Because, you know, Paul writes very, uh, you know, inspiringly that uh, sin has no more place in our lives and we don't need to give it the time of day. And once we've died with Christ, we're in this grace-filled country. And my experience is that although I believe all that's true, it's been much harder to live that truth. So um, as I have walked through my life and... <laughs> Generally, it's easier to see it with somebody else than myself. But anyway, um, as we walk through this life, I think I don't want anything else to own me, to to inform my decisions, to um, to have be a part of what drives me besides uh, God and Jesus Christ. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times, one of the books I really love is Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And he talks about this image of having God be the center of our decisions and looking at what else might own us and drive us besides God's love. And he tells the example of a friend who used to uh, get the morning paper every single day. And that was his routine as he got the newspaper every single day and really didn't think anything of it until one day he went out onto his porch to get his newspaper and it wasn't there. And he became very upset and he was like, oh, somebody's taken my paper and oh, that's not right. And rah, 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 rah. and he became very, <laughs> very incensed by the fact that he didn't have his newspaper when he thought he had to have his newspaper and he was going to talk to the neighbor because he think the neighbor took it. Anyway, he looks around and he sees that it's gone into the bushes, but in the midst of that time in between realizing that it's gone into the bushes and um, and looking for the paper. And in his prayer time, he realizes that he is too attached um, to that newspaper being there. And so he gives up newspapers for Lent. And then I think um, I'd have to go back and read Richard Foster's story. But I, what I imagine, although I'm not sure it's accurate in the book, but that as the man gives up newspapers for a time, that when he enters back in to relationship with his newspaper, it's a more healthy. Again, I think that's for me what, um, what has been helpful in my life is that if I felt like anything was um, overridingly just too much of my attention and too much of my heart, then I would talk to God about that and would see if that is, um, if I'm putting that before my relationship with God. <laughs> Chocolate comes to mind. <laughs> or food or worry, which uh, th my decision to give up worry was because, again, logically, if I am uh, die with Christ and raised to new life, A, what have I got to worry about? But also B, Worry says to my heart and to my soul that um, God can't handle what's happening in my life if I worry about it. So, um, so that was my decision. I think it was like in 19, early 1990s to give up worry because it, it didn't fit with what I understood in terms of my relationship with God. Again, none of this is because, oh, Mary, so whatever. It's simply because of what Paul writes that um, that means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. I believe that. I believe what Paul is saying is true. I believe that as we live deeper into that death in Christ 
and let everything else that would harm us, sin that would own us, things that would hurt us, um, as we let that die with Christ, we get resurrected into this grace-filled world. And so you can imagine that this foundation that God was building in my life, um, through the writings of Paul, through Jesus walking with me, has been extremely helpful going through chemotherapy, which is over. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Because, um, you know, again, there was sometimes it was like, okay, God, I really am good to go because this is really not happy in my body. But also that I'm not going to worry about whether it's working or whether it's not or what the next step is or even that um, I have cancer, which is just kind of a really weird concept to even now wrap my mind around. But God, you have my life. You have my entire life because I let it die in Christ. And so now my entire grace-filled life is to be yours. So yeah, you get that too. Um, to me, it's a really logical <laughs> and um, good way, joyful way, uh, grace-filled way to live this life. And like I said, you know, if you have time, you know, I'm thinking about if you want to give thanks for something on tomorrow, it's tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. You could read Romans 6, 1 through 14, because this to me is the center thing that I give thanks for, that Jesus Christ um, and the scripture and communities of faith gave me a way to understand my old life, my sin-filled life, my broken life as being dead with Christ's crucifixion and death. And that when baptism occurred, that I was, or even, you know, when I made that commitment to Christ, I mean, I, I think baptism is a wonderful symbol, but I think for me that really occurred in July of uh, 1973 when I made my commitment. Being raised into this new life in Christ means I'm all God's <laughs> and I don't need to give sin the time of day and um, that there's joy in each day because God has brought me into this grace-filled world of seeing clearly um, with Jesus Christ. So uh, that's me this morning. Um, Paul is wonderful and I guess I did do it uh, kind of quick. <laughs> I thought I would be long, but I think I'm done. And again, um, I just think with Thanksgiving tomorrow, this wonderful, wonderful writing of Paul, um, paraphrased by Eugene Peterson, is to me the central thing that I give thanks for. That through scripture, through Paul's writing, through Jesus's life and death, I have a way of understanding that all the old brokenness can die and I can be raised into new life. And quite frankly, for me, that's a daily event. <laughs> this is not a one-time bad person event, even though Paul talks about it in that way. For me, this is a daily event where I can let everything that was broken and old um, die again that you know, even if you think about the day ending and dying and when the sun comes up again, that new life that has been offered to me, embracing it new again every morning. So if that's not enough theological concepts for one day, I don't know what is. But thank you guys for watching. It's good to see people um, on my live feed. Uh, and uh, hopefully maybe even the phone is a, a little bit clearer, but who knows? Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving.